it's summertime and frozen custard is just what you need to beat the summer heat. Welcome back to Hungry Theologian, helping you taste and see that the Lord is good. Frozen custard is just like ice cream, but denser, richer, and creamier. For me, it's all the best parts of ice cream, but taken to the next level. I'm going to start with a base vanilla frozen custard recipe, and then show you two of my favorite flavors. Now let's get cooking. In a medium saucepan, add four egg yolks, a quarter cup of sugar, two tablespoons light corn syrup, and whisk until combined. Then add half a cup of whole milk and one cup of heavy cream and whisk until combined. Heat this mixture over medium heat until it reaches 170 Fahrenheit or until the custard remains on the back of a spoon and your finger leaves a clean line. Remove from the heat and whisk in an eighth of a teaspoon kosher salt and half a teaspoon vanilla extract. Strain through a fine mesh strainer. This is the base vanilla custard that we'll add flavors to. First, some fresh Georgia peaches. I want a strong peach flavor, so I'm slicing three peaches and removing the skin and pit. Add the sliced peaches to a blender or food processor and puree until smooth. Then pass the peach puree through a fine mesh strainer and fold it into your custard. Next up is a cold brew coffee custard. Summer is a great time to be making cold brew coffee, so why not add a little bit to your frozen custard? There are a variety of ways that you can make cold brew coffee, so I'll leave links in the description to my favorite tools. The traditional method involves slowly steeping ground coffee in cold water for 12 to 24 hours. In the last few years, I've really enjoyed cold brew from this rapid cold brew machine. It uses pumps to extract the cold brew in just 15 minutes. But because the extraction is happening with cold water, you still get the cold brew flavor profile with reduced bitterness and acidity. It's worth checking out if you drink a lot of cold brew. The vanilla custard base is the same, but this time I'll add a quarter cup of cold brew. Allow the custard mixture to cool completely in the fridge for a couple hours before churning. Then churn in an ice cream maker according to the manufacturer's instructions. I'll leave a link in the description to the model I'm using, which I recommend. It's affordable and does a great job. You just have to leave the bowl in the freezer overnight before you can use it to churn. If you're using the same kind of ice cream maker that I'm using, then you can't necessarily make frozen custard on a whim, or you can't make multiple batches back to back because you have to keep refreezing the bowl overnight after each batch. You could buy multiple of these freezer bowls and keep them in your freezer, but eventually you're gonna run out of freezer space. Essentially, unless you get one of those expensive compressor powered ice cream machines, there's gonna be limitations on your frozen custard production. And those limitations got me thinking about the Sabbath. In Exodus 31, God repeats the Sabbath instructions to Moses, but this time he adds that anyone who breaks the Sabbath should be put to death. And this seems a little bit extreme. The death penalty for working seven days a week? Whenever we encounter something in the text like this that seems to cut against our modern assumptions, we should pay attention to what's actually going on in the text. Our modern assumptions aren't necessarily correct, but they can highlight things in the text that we should dig in and pay a little more attention to. The death penalty for breaking the Sabbath seems extreme, so let's pay attention to the way the Sabbath is described in this text and why it's given so much weight. The Sabbath is described as a sign of the covenant between God and the people of Israel, and the Sabbath is to be observed throughout the generations to remind the people of Israel that the Lord sanctifies them. The Sabbath points back to Genesis, when God made heaven and earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. So just from reading this chapter, we know that the Sabbath isn't only about giving people a day off. The observance of the Sabbath communicates important truths about God and God's people. The Sabbath is a recognition that we're finite creatures. We're not infinite like our Creator, so we can't work indefinitely. As creatures, we need to rest. And anyone who's ever pulled an all-nighter knows just how important rest is. The institution of the Sabbath reminds humanity that God is unlimited, but we are limited. The Sabbath shows us how to live in tune with nature. 
We weren't made to work endlessly, but we were made to engage in a regular rhythm of work and rest. The Sabbath is so important to Israel because the Sabbath proclaims the goodness of Israel's God. Unlike Pharaoh, who demanded endless toil and bricks without straw, Yahweh teaches humanity to live in tune with nature, with the way we were created. And the Sabbath as an institution was meant to extend to the entire Israelite community, including foreigners living among them, servants, even animals. After being rescued from Egypt, Israel was to be what Alistair Roberts has called a liberated and liberating people. Practicing the Sabbath was a way for the Israelites to use their freedom to help others experience the freedom of living in tune with their created nature. And in doing so, the Sabbath would proclaim the uniqueness of the Creator God. Thanks for watching, and if you want to support these videos, please click the like button and share this with a friend.